I owe you guys a brief explanation for the change in name of the channel. Yes, I am partnering with Dr. Anil Rama. Legally, we're completely separate entities, but I really like Dr. Anil Rama. I think he's doing the best job of providing patients with a comprehensive understanding or profile of their sleep disordered breathing. So it was an honor to partner with him. I'm also starting my master's in sleep medicine at the University of Oxford. So there's gonna be some major changes coming to the channel, including, which I hope excites some of you, uploading more than this loose one time per month upload schedule that I'm currently on. Yeah, that's basically it. Uh, let's get on to the content of the video because I have to start making the content for you guys in the next video. I hope you guys enjoy. I get a lot of questions about flow limitation, if flow limitation is a problem, what does flow limitation look like, and so on. So I'm gonna do a really short video all about flow limitation. I know this might look a little bit annoying or scary, but don't run away, I'll break it down. It's actually really easy to understand. So I'm gonna start in the top right here with this picture. What this is in the top panel is pressure. So obviously the higher, the higher the pressure. You can see pressure is around 12 and let's say a half. And then right here where the arrow is, pressure goes down, right? And stays down. So what happens to the breath? Well, the breath is fully rounded, fully rounded, fully rounded, fully rounded. And then right here where the pressure goes down, we can see that the breath is no longer fully rounded. It's kind of flat. Flow limitation develops and some more develops and so on. And you can see all of these breaths afterwards, after the reduction in pressure, have flow limitation. They're flatter. Now, also very interesting, and this bottom panel is negative pressure. This is negative pressure in the airway. The more negative the pressure in the airway, the more susceptible it's going to be to collapse, right? So what happens when the pressure goes down? Well, we can see that, so just to, just to contextualize things, the, the lower this is, the more the negative pressure, right? So when the pressure goes down, we can see that there's more negative pressure more negative pressure. And then we can see it goes even more and more negative alongside the flow limitation. So just to summarize, theoretically, reduction in pressure results in development of flow limitation, development of flow limitation theoretically translates to increased negative pressure in the airway. Increased negative pressure theoretically translates to increased respiratory effort, which translates into arousals and more fragmented sleep. Now, each patient needs to be looked at individually, and, and just because there's an increase in some negative pressure doesn't mean that someone's sleep is going to be fragmented. But these things correlate with each other. That, that, that's the idea here. So on the left side, uh, this is a study with normal people, so control, male patients with sleep apnea, and female patients with sleep apnea. And the researchers basically categorized or classified seven different types of breaths. So you can see class one, this is normal. This is a normal breath. It's well-rounded, and we can see that the controls are the people who didn't have sleep apnea. This is the most common breath for them. Down here in the table, the researchers provide an interpretation for what they believe the class of breath represents. Now, of course, they append to this that, you know, we can't say this with any amount of certainty. We're just speculating, but this is sort of a rough idea of what's going on. So in the first class, so this one, the well-rounded one, it's normal. Is there flow limitation? No. Class two, which looks like this. You have a peak and then kind of a plateau and then a second peak. They describe it as two peaks during inspiration. And their interpretation is that the upper airway reopening after it initially collapses. Is there flow limitation? Yes. And they do this for each one of these breaths. So you guys can maybe start looking at your breaths and asking whether they look like any of these classification of breaths. Now, in the data as well, there's a, other interesting insights that we can extract. For example, this class four breath, there's actually quite, uh, you know, for the normal people, they have quite a bit of these. M they have more of these than the people, the males with sleep apnea and the females with sleep apnea. We can also see that there seems to be sex differences. So this, remember this white bar is the females. So the white bar is much taller than this striped bar, which is the male patients with sleep apnea. So male patients with sleep apnea, female patients with sleep apnea. So it looks like females are getting much more of this class of flow limitation. The same can be said for class six over here. It seems to be predominantly in females or 
you know, more so in females. One other thing I wanted to bring to your attention, which I think ties in nicely with this video, is this other freeware that exists out there called the Glasgow Index. I'll leave the links and so on in the description for everyone to access this. You can read all this to explain what it does. But basically what it does is it identifies and characterizes breaths, that are pathological or abnormal. That is breaths which are not well-rounded. And it gives an interpretation to them and then it tallies them and identifies them throughout the night when you upload your data. Just open it down here uh, and then you have to choose a file. So this is the file type, brp.edf. So you gotta make sure to open that type of file. So here you can see January 1st, 2025. So all of these are breaths which are considered not good breaths. And what the software does is it quantifies how much of those breaths there are. And then it adds up all of these different types to give you an overall score. Now you want this to be low, right? So, so for example, the skew breath, which you can read up on in, in the page I was just on, you can see wherever there's a tick, that's where we had a skewed breath throughout the night. And you can click anywhere on here to see exactly what that looks like. So as you can see here on the X axis, we have time, so 2.34 a.m. And the red contour is considered the idealized breath. And the blue one is your breath. And you can see that this breath is slightly skewed to the right, which is why it got a skew label and is included in the skew column up here. One thing that I feel is going to be quite interesting, and I invite all you guys to share whatever insights you guys can extract from your own data, is how this variable amplitude value changes with the application of adjunct loop gain therapies, which are discussed in, of course, the Dr. Robert Thomas interviews that I've done in the past. I would be interested to see if adding certain adjunct therapies for loop gain will reduce this variable amplitude value, all other things constant. So yeah, there you go. There's a, another little tool that you can use to play around with to understand the granular details of your data to see how much pathological breathing you might have. I have to, of course, you know, disclaim that this is not medical advice. This software is not validated. So of course, we cannot use this to diagnose medical conditions or anything like that, but um, it is very interesting. And incorporating this into what Oscar provides, I think is the next step in refining and improving and understanding any given patient's uh, individual sleep disorder breathing profile. If you haven't seen my video on flow limitation, showing how much flow limitation is normal, I highly recommend that one for you because it really drives home the point that flow limitation isn't necessarily pathological or an issue. It has to be placed into context.